So I recently got done reading this book. Uh, it's called Against Method by Paul Feuerabend. Feuerabend. I can't uh, really figure out how his name is pronounced. It's F U Y E R A B E N D. He's an Austrian philosopher. But anyway, he's, he's a philosopher of science. Uh, he actually studied under Karl Popper for a while. But um, it's. Uh, it's a really fascinating book, and um, he's probably the most radical philosopher of science I've ever met. Uh, it's he, he advocates what's called epistemological anarchism. He, he argues that there is no consistent, exception-free method by which science can be defined. Uh, there is no demarcation point between science and pseudoscience. Um, and this is going to uh, started a lot of people. That's why a lot of his critics labeled him uh, the enemy of science, which it's kind of funny because uh, he, he was actually one of the sort of forerunners of this idea called eliminative materialism, which you may know associated but, uh, with uh, with Daniel Dennett and Paul and Patricia Churchill and people like that. But um, so he's obviously so he wasn't some new age kook. He was actually you know very much materialist and a realist, but uh, he had a very uh, but but his view views on science seemed to open a lot of doors that people were very uncomfortable with. Um, now the the idea that uh, falsificationism doesn't work as a scientific methodology was already around at the time that he was writing. I mean uh, Thomas Kuhn with his idea of paradigms. It always showed that uh, with any new paradigm, it doesn't need to be falsified because every theory is already falsified by certain anomalies that are there from the, from the beginning. And rather than theory, it simply helps frame the evidence that is uh, you know, that is observed. And it, the theory can work can work and work well even with those anomalies. Uh, so, so Feuerabend kind of it starts from this Kuhnian attitude and goes a little further than that. Um, everything he, he points out that uh, you know that science isn't even really one entity. There's rather this uh, group of diverse practices uh, known as the sciences that uh, have that have gained this sort of popular acceptance as science proper, um, and you know that they have. Some have more consistent results than others, you know. And a lot of, you know, if you if you go to a university and talk to you know, physics majors or biology majors, uh, you know, they're, those are called the hard sciences. And then you have what are called the social sciences, like what I majored in. I was a sociology major. You know, that, that was, that's not, that's classified as the social science. And yes, the hard science majors were that, whether that's scientific, and and they would they would scoff and say, oh, of course not, no. But it's not because of methodology. It's, I mean, as you know, quantitative sociology is you know, every bit as rigorous as a lot of uh, hard sciences. It's just uh, it doesn't get the kind of results that a physicist might get with their experiments, um, and that's really how we end up judging these things is by the results that we get. I mean, if you kind of say anything that's doubtful of science, well, people will tell you, well, they'll tell you, well, you're using this computer and you're using, you know, the uh, you know, and and uh, and you have this artificial light. How's that working out for you? So, yeah. So we, we judge science by the results it brings, often often in the form of technology. So, um, so so it's really not methodology that we're looking at, but rather results. It's it's a pragmatic uh, aspect. Um, and actually, if you try to apply the methodology of one science to another, you often get divergent results. Uh, and, and one thing he, he wants to point out is that um, you know we, we have this kind of positivist idea about observation that we observe things in the universe and then uh, that we don't develop theories based on that observation. Well, what he wants to point out is that observation is always already theory laden. Uh, theory reframes our own perceptions. I mean that's like um, you know, he. he yeah, it, it tells us what our what perceptions are, are valid. Like um, one example that he spends a lot of time on is uh, Galileo and his uh, observations in the telescope. 
Now, we look at that now and just see that as the sort of oppression of religion, you know, because this big dogmatic church was uh, coming down in Galileo. Well, actually, a lot of the, actually, the church at the time was very much a sponsor of, uh, of science, and uh, their idea was that they would, and they were willing to shift church, dog, church dogma in the face of uh, compelling evidence. But the point is, they were in a, an Aristotelian paradigm, and one thing, in order to understand Aristotelian science, you have to understand Aristotelian epistemology. And what Aristotle said was, uh, Aristotle's idea about uh, observation was that you made a, a plain observation if you were sober of, uh, you know, of clear mind, you know, of, of uh, you know, had good working senses, had, had healthy senses, and observed with those naked senses without distortion. Now, Galileo's telescope, Galileo's telescope had these um, lenses in it which distorted your vision. So that meant you were not looking through your naked senses and uh, were therefore distorting your, sen your senses and such information would not be reliable. So it seems ridiculous to us now, but within the, uh, but based on the, the theoretical background of the time, um, his, uh, you know, his, his observations couldn't really be seen to count. So, um, and, I, and actually I find this really interesting um, in terms of subjective science. Like a lot of people I know will sort of discount mystical experiences because of the fact that, uh, you know, there are, there are um, the correlates in the brain, you know, neurological signals that are correlated with certain mystical experiences or, you know, that uh, they can be induced by psychedelic drugs or whatever, and, and that, that for, therefore this proves them, which I think, it, I find that very similar to the whole um, idea that, that the Galileo telescope had lenses and therefore distorted your vision. You know, it, it's, the, it's the idea that there is a, um, that there is one state of consciousness that is objective and others are all distortions. So. Um, but anyway, so, I mean, what we get from this is the kind of mutual influence between theory and observation. Observation can modify theory, and theory can modify observation. I mean, and Galileo had had to get had a lot of work to do to uh, to sort of reframe how we interpret our observations of motion. You know, it, the idea a lot of people had this theory that had this idea that if um, if the Earth is moving, then if you drop an object from a high tower saying it should have moved uh, you know somewhat to you know, off off to the side as it drops in accordance with the motion of the earth rather than straight down so guys obviously they didn't, they didn't have Newton's theory of, gravi of gravity at the time so yeah the point Galileo he argues is, is basically was basically kind of a propagandist and he said that all oftentimes new theories um, need to be pushed by propaganda before they can you know, gather the evidence necessary to form a strong foundation. Um, and so you know, there's a kind of, so ultimately we have to, um, the theories just have to kind of fit together in a way, and oftentimes new theories don't fit together with, uh, with, the, with the existing evidence in a, in a way that uh, serious people, and, and so there's, and so they tend to be rejected until, um, and, and, and until, as uh, Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> you know, uh, so there, yeah, and, and often, you know, the way that I, I, I think, and you know, and right now we have relativity and quantum mechanics, which don't really agree with each other, and we have this. Uh, this new field of string theory, which has almost like practically no empirical support whatsoever, it's it, it's a, it's almost purely theoretical, as as a, as a kind of ad hoc hypothesis in order to make them make the two fit together, uh, and um, and people who defend string theory will say, oh, it's so mathematically beautiful, and then, and it's, but you know they don't have empiricism to make make that up, and that, and that's actually. It, what 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 Fairbairn uh, suggests is, is that 
science is that new theories often have to use these ad hoc hypotheses in order to bolster up their theory, which, uh, you know, according to Karl Popper's falsification criteria, ad hoc hypotheses are to, to be avoided at all costs. But you know, it's just saying that actually these are very natural things that scientists do. Um, so he, he's already, so he's saying that you know science is actually a lot messier than than we take it to be, and uh, that philosophers of science like Karl Hopper are really uh, just sort of they're like publicists for uh, for for science. They're not uh, you know scientists will parade them outward in order, in order to gain respect for their profession, but when it comes time it comes time to actually doing science, they'll sort of shoo them out of the room because they need to actually. Uh, because because they're they end up being a nuisance from when they actually need to do some work and find some uh, from some real things out, um, and so uh, Feyerbend is, is he's not against science per se, but you know I mean he's very supportive of supportive of you know the science uh, of many of the sciences, but what he wants to argue against is this idea of a kind of unified scientific worldview. Which is often used for very propagandist purposes, which he finds are often very problematic. Um, in many third world countries, you know, the scientific worldview is identified with the Western worldview, which is, you know, which basically means that's kind of taking the place of Christianity. I mean, cr Christianity was uh, was traditionally identified with the Western worldview, and to be Christian meant to be Western, and now it's like to be scientific is to be Western, and. Um, and so it become this thing becomes a vehicle for cultural imperialism, and I mean there's a, there's a great example that he talks about uh, in China um, during the Cultural Revolution. You know, uh, Mao was was obviously had imported the idea of Marxism from the West, uh, and and so you know didn't have a lot of respect for traditional Chinese culture per se, and wanted to modernize the world by westernizing it. And so a lot of these traditional Chinese practices, such as Chinese medicine, were kind of suppressed. And then um, later, in like starting with the 70s, you had Deng Xiaoping's um, reform that wanted to bring back a lot of Chinese culture. And then Chinese medicine was supported, uh, and uh, a lot of research poured into it. And they've actually found that there's a lot of um, empirical data that supports Chinese medicine, even though it was viewed as superstitious from this Western scientific uh, you know, worldview, and uh, and and so you know, yeah, we should be wary of science being used to sort of um, put down and annihilate these forms of traditional cultural knowledge. Yeah, and and so I am, and so yeah, Lynn, that's great. But a lot of a lot of people, and you know, a lot of people will still feel uneasy with this because you know, you have to ask ask the question, you know. How do we then determine what's actually true? You know, I think it's in science is supposed to show us what's really true, and uh, I, th I think what he's going to say is that there's really no easy answers. I mean, uh, you know, what we want is the proliferation of ideas, a, a, a kind of a, a kind of uh, space in which ideas can be freely exchanged. And his idea is yes, science has produced a lot of great ideas and a lot of um, and a lot of great results. But so the humanities, so the social sciences, so of all kinds of different areas of human knowledge, and uh, none of them should just be privileged out of this kind of bias we have uh, for one of them being giving us objective reality. Um, that they sh that they shall be able to exchange um, on a, a kind of equal ground, and um, don't always get to have the, uh, the discourse on their own terms, and. So, you know, the, it, it, it can be scary, I mean, because there are a lot of, you know, strain, there, there are things like creationism, there's climate change now, there are a lot of things where we want to say that, you know, deviating from the, the scientific worldview causes a lot of problems. But ultimately, I mean, these, these ideas are going to be around no matter what, uh, and uh, we kind of have to trust that in a space of open discussion, uh, um, that the good ideas will prevail, and you know there there are lots of you know bad ideas that sort of have their own research programs that start off and then end up self-destructing because uh, they end up being so unsatisfactory. So, um, 
essentially, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. One one of the books he, he cites a lot is actually John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, which is all about the sort of free exchange of ideas. And he's saying that that really should be kind of our model of science is uh, is to kind of take it down from its uh, from its high horse and actually uh, put it on on par with other realms of human knowledge, so that uh, and that in the connected benefits from this and um, draw ideas from other fields of knowledge, um, but you know, much better when it's kind of put in a more humble position. So. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what I have to say. I, I find his ideas really intriguing, um, and I li and I like to think that that the yes that uh, the proliferation of ideas is the best uh, is kind of the best policy. But I'm still not sure where that leaves us in terms of epistemology, in terms of figuring out what's what's actually true. But um, I have to say I'm a fan, and I recommend I recommend his work to anyone. Uh, anyway, um, thanks for listening.